This is Gary. Today we're coming to Hebrews chapter 8, and I kind of like the first verse because it, it really uh, gets us started off really well. It says, now this is the main point of the things uh, we are saying. Uh, that's a great way to uh, you know, start a chapter. I, I kind of probably understand why the, 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 the people that put this, uh, you know, the, the copy of, the, of this Bible together, that, that why the chapter break is where it is. Yes. In because this case. In this case, <laughs> it, it might make yeah. some sense. You yeah. know, it says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which, it, which the Lord erected and not man. And so here we're starting off chapter 8. We're talking talking about Jesus as our high priest. We're talking about, uh, you know, what he is really ruling over this new uh, tabernacle as, as, it, as it describes it, uh, that he is, you know, overseeing, that he is uh, uh, helping lead and instruct. Um, and so what are we going, what are we getting into here in chapter eight as we get started? Well, really chapter eight is, begins, as you've already noted, by explaining why in the world did we talk so much about Melchizedek right. and about Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's come along now and he's explaining that whereas the, the high priest on earth was just that, he was a high priest on earth and he was a, only a high priest for a limited period of time. But in contrast to that, our high priest, Jesus, is actually in heaven, seated on the right hand of the throne of God. And this is at least the second time in the book of Hebrews, first time being in chapter one, mm -hmm. where he points out that he has, he's sat down now, which you only do when your work's done right. in a certain sense. And his primary work had been done. As high priest, he'd offered the greatest sacrifice the world has ever known. He gave himself uh, and now, having done that, since it's a one-time offering, never to be repeated, and we've already seen that too, then he can sit down. And so he goes on and talks about the throne of the majesty in heavens, and, and he starts to, to compare it to the tabernacle. He does. And this is basically the first time, as I recall at least, that, that the writer of Hebrews has gone into the tabernacle He's getting ready to go into that for some time now, he but is. that's where he's going. Uh, he's going to talk about the minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not man. Obviously, tabernacle under the law of Moses was erected by men. Uh, talented men, mm -hmm. given talent by God, right. no doubt about that, but still erected by God. Man, absolutely, yeah. and I, I think that, and you highlighted it with your uh, your inflection as you came through. You said "true," and you kind of put some emphasis there yeah. on that word "true" because this is going to be something that is going to be far greater. Obviously, uh, not o not only because it was erected by God instead of erected by man, but is is going to represent and is going to be for something that is going to be eternal, something that's going to last. Uh, the, the the tabernacle of, uh, of the Old Testament it had a had an end point. It, it had a beginning point, but also had an end point. Uh, and and uh, so it was inferior to this tabernacle that is being, or that has been established, right. uh, you know, in Christ. And so he, he goes on and he says, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Uh, the, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the priests did offer multiple different types oh, of, of gifts and sacrifices uh, uh, there, there before God. Uh, these were sometimes for themselves, sometimes for the people, uh, especially when we talk about the Day of Atonement. You know, the high priest himself would offer a sacrifice for himself, for his sins, right. also for the sins <laughs> of the people. But throughout the year, they had multiple sacrifices and gift offerings and things that, that, they, that they did in order to be pleasing uh, for God. And so Jesus himself... He had a he had a sacrifice. He had a gift. He had an offering that was going to be made. Uh, what was that offering? It was his blood, his, his blood. own blood. That's right. Which chapter nine <laughs> is going to really you know uh, highlight exactly. <clears throat> and so it's something that it says that you know it was necessary for this one uh, also have something to offer when he had, and what he, what he had to offer was far greater than than what the other okay. priest had to offer. Uh, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the, the law. 
Um, Jesus was not a priest according to the law. Right. Uh, he was not uh, eligible, actually, right. you know, based on his lineage, based on his heritage uh, and what tribe he came from. He was not eligible to be a priest uh, under the, uh, the Levitical law. Uh, and so not only could he not be, but uh, he was bringing about something new. He was bringing about a, a new law, a new covenant uh, that he would be the sacrifice, he would be the offering, the gift, uh, as you said a moment ago. And so uh, where do we go as we continue on uh, from here? Well, he goes on and, and talks about having already said, as you noted, that he couldn't serve as a priest on earth. He then talks a little bit about the priests on earth. And he says in regard to them who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Has to be one of the most remarkable thoughts in all of Scripture if you really zero in on it, because, he, because this word pattern that he uses here is, is a word that, that means the impression left by a blow. Uh, before your youngest, James, was born, he could not leave an impression on the wall. No. Uh, his, his mom might think, well, he left some impressions, all right. But, yeah. But, yeah, absolutely. To her internal rib cage, yeah. you know, as he yeah. kicked and punched and everything yeah. else. But, yeah. but no, he wasn't, he was not uh, out of the womb yet. He could not make an impact on this physical life outside, right. of, outside of her body. Right. Uh, and so he could not do that. And yet, what we're talking about here is an impression that was made that was not that could be seen, that could be experienced, right. that, and, you know, was something that... Uh, and that means the original existed. That's right. See, as James couldn't make that blow till he got out of the womb. Right. And obviously had to grow up a little bit he did. To, to do more than that. He did. But still, uh, for illustration's purposes, it works. Exactly, exactly. So here what he's saying is uh, there was... God already had the tabernacle, that the real, the true mm -hmm. tabernacle, which you highlighted and I both, I highlighted that word true. The true tabernacle already existed in the mind of God. And so when, when he had Moses to erect the tabernacle and gave him dimensions and all those various things, he was doing that based on the actual thing the, the real tabernacle, the true tabernacle. And so everything in the tabernacle under the law of Moses is laid out in a systematic way mm -hmm. to represent what will come later in the church and heaven. Absolutely. And it's, it's a wonderful pattern. In fact, it is a marvelous study. When you go back and you study the tabernacle uh, and then come forward and you compare it to, to Jesus, to his church, to all of it ac across the board, it is a wonderful study that right. just really helps you to appreciate uh, what we have, what we have in Christ, what we have in the church. Um, it's, it brings a greater appreciation for that. Notice, I think the, one of the key words here is the word pattern. Yes. Notice throughout Scripture, God has a pattern. He has he a pattern in his own behavior. He has a pattern in what he establishes. Uh, he has a pattern in what he expects. Uh, you know, And so you see patterns over and over again that God establishes that we are to follow, that we are to imitate, that we are to uh, to live uh, according to, uh, just as they were to to build the earthly tabernacle according to a pattern. Right. Uh, we have patterns from God that we are uh, to follow after as well. Verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, uh, which was established on better promises. Um, you know, we see this more excellent ministry here that, uh, he, that he is being des described. Uh, I know there's so much within these, these couple of verses here, or in this verse here, that really sticks out. One of the big words that sticks out to me is the word mediator. Uh, mediator is, a, is a, you know, is something that... Um, that oftentimes between individuals, we need a mediator. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. uh, we need someone to, to come between. We need somebody to help, uh, you know, say what the other person is saying and, uh, you know, make sure that both sides are, you know, ultimately at the, at the end, uh, that both sides are at least aware of what's going on and what the, the current situation is. 
when you see in this verse this more excellent ministry uh, and Jesus as this mediator, and of course he's going to be better of, of, than, than everything. Uh, what does this uh, verse say? Well, if you start first with the the ministry, there's a recognition uh, here that the Levitical priests did have a ministry. Mm -hmm. They ministered before God, uh, as you said, making sacrifices and so forth for themselves, but also uh, regularly for the people as well. Uh, he, in order to have a new priesthood, we've we've kind of already picked up on that. You got to have a new covenant, right? You can't. the 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 law of Moses would not allow, as you've noted today, it was in in this chapter. Jesus couldn't be a priest right. under the law of Moses. So there had to be a new covenant. And, and notice that the writer says it's a better covenant. He loves that word. He does. Uh, 13 times in, in the book, twice in this verse. Yes. Uh, not just better covenant, but it's based on better promises. Now think about it. The Levitical priest could offer a sacrifice for sin, but it didn't really take it away. Right. Now, it, it was no longer in certain senses of the word, to the actual immediate credit of the individual. It was put on account, so to speak. But I don't know about you, my accounts come due on a regular basis. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, every month, the way you're supposed to uh, treat, it, <laughs> treat a credit card is you're supposed to pay it off at the end of every month so you don't That's get right. all those interest charges. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to our sin life, um, we don't want the, the account to just be uh, to, to start gaining interest and start rolling over into the <laughs> next time and still have a, a debt that's really out there and needs to be paid. Jesus paid the ultimate price. Uh, he paid the ultimate sacrifice that uh, was able to uh, pay that price for sin, uh, you know, and so he died for the sins of mankind. And what a wonderful sacrifice uh, that he, he was, that he is, uh, which made him the best mediator uh, possible, right. uh, you know, it, it made him the, the the best mediator of this new covenant, uh, of these new promises, of of everything that he is uh, able to really. Well, he's able to deliver uh, something that is far greater than the old uh, the old covenant could. Well, yeah, and think about it as mediator. He gets to go to the Father, if we put this kind of in human, human terms, terms, Yes. he gets to go to the Father and say, look, I know this fellow was offensive to you because of his sins, but my blood has, has eliminated those sins, so you two ought to get along. Right, yes, <laughs> and that, that's, that's very well put and, and uh, far better than I could have because here, uh, in the most simple terms, that is... That is what he's doing. I know there's it's, there's more complexity to that, oh, yeah. uh, and you know, and we're uh, we say this in in a way to just try to help explain. But Jesus, he cares about us so much, right. and that's the thing. Some mediators don't care; they are right. just a mediator. We have a mediator that cares. We have a mediator that loves. That was right. to the point of dying for us on the cross, you know. And so that makes him, you know, when you think about it, just the perfect mediator, and, and to it be does. able to be unbiased. You know, a, a mediator that usually cares that much, the reason that's important, the mediator doesn't maybe not even know both parties so they can be unbiased. He is he is really unbiased. He, he Now, he has his people. He loves his people. He wants them to be saved before God, but he wants that for all of mankind. Right. Uh, you have to meet his conditions. You have to meet uh, his terms. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing as Jesus as our, as our mediator uh, of a better covenant, uh, which has better promises uh, that we all get to in Christ. Uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy that covenant, enjoy those promises. And the writer immediately now, because he says better covenant, he sets about to prove, now look, God told you fellows a long time ago there was going to be another covenant. And so in verse 7, he says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Just a brief comment as far as I'm concerned. You may have more to say, but uh, the problem with the law of Moses was not in reference to the law, it was in reference to man. Right. Man didn't live perfectly. Oh, absolutely. And so the fault in the first covenant was really man in a certain certain way of speaking. Mm -hmm. So now he goes ahead and to prove that there had to be a covenant without fault and that God anticipated that, 
he begins to quote from Jeremiah 31, and it's really a pretty extensive quote here. It is. Uh, where he says, because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. I know that's a long reading and there's a lot there. There so, I, I, But I, I thought we better get the whole quote, although the last verse wasn't a part of the quote, <laughs> but I thought we better get the whole quote and then go back and pick out the little, the things that are there. So what do you see? Well, I mean, first, you know, I, as you said, this was, he was quoting here from Jeremiah 31, uh, you know, really verses 31 and falling, you know, right. uh, uh, there in Jeremiah. And so that, as you see uh, him kind of start really coming through this, um, he's talking about a, a day that was coming. He's quoting about a day uh, right. that was coming that there in Jeremiah, I mean, the, the, the prophet there, he's speaking to a people that, um, that really have a, a lo lost their way. I mean, really have, you know, turned, turned aside. And so when, when he says there, uh, as he quotes there in verse eight, you know, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is something that that people back then really needed to to hear and to understand because you know th these people were were, were eventually going to be in captivity and they're going to spend their time in captivity uh, and Israel was not going to be Israel the same way it had always been even once they came back from captivity in the books of Ezra and all those things right. they were still not the same Israel as they had been before you know there were there was things would start creeping in and uh, you know uh, they would allow you know their own laws and their own interpret interpretations really or uh, really not interpretations just uh, additions uh, to the law to really change things up so when Jesus came he came in a time period in which was perfect as the as scripture has said but he came uh, in, in a time that uh, he was going to bring about this this new covenant and new law to a people that really had started drifting away uh, you know, at least a, a lot, a, many of them had had started drifting away from that old law because they couldn't keep it perfectly. No, uh, they could not keep it perfectly. So that's what I kind of I see when I start off here in verse eight. You know, I see about a, a coming of something that now the Hebrew writer is saying this is already this has already happened. This has already come. But he's looking forward from the from the prophet Jeremiah saying these days are coming. Right. And remember when Jeremiah wrote, mm -hmm. Israel and Judah were separate. They were. Israel had already been conquered That's right. by the, the by Assyrians. Assyrians. Uh, Judah was about to be conquered. Exactly. That's what Jeremiah is telling them. That's right. And, but notice that in under this new covenant, they once again will be whole. They will be one. That's not just them, not of just course. Them. No, but, but, but they don't know that yet. No, they don't, they don't, know. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't recognize, recognize that yet. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. That's right. And so it's not going to be the same covenant no. that he made with them at Sinai when he brought them out of Egypt. Not going to be that. Uh, why not? Well, because they disregarded him. They violated that covenant on a regular basis. They, they did. violated that covenant. Instead, he says, I'm going to make a covenant. This time it's not going to be on tables of stone. It's going to be in your mind. It's going to be in your heart. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen with this new covenant. A absolutely. I, I, lo I love there when you look there in verse 10. For it says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Um, and we, th we think about that today, that the laws of God, the, the law of Christ here in the New Testament, is something that we can, we can understand and we can comprehend and uh, we can 
take from his word. And, and really, if you look, if you even pay attention to, as we talked about before, just the, the world in general that God created, everything, you know, we take all of this and we can see God. We can see God in the world. We can see God in the scripture. And we, we know we have right in front of us exactly what we need to do right. in order to be pleasing before him. Uh, and through Christ, it's possible. Through Christ, uh, that redemption and that salvation and that reconciliation is totally possible uh, through him. And he's the one that makes it perfect. He's the one that makes it whole. Um, the Old Testament law the, and Israel in itself, it had its uh, imperfections. It was people, as you said before. The people made it imperfect. Uh, if they were sinless, then the Old Testament law would have, would have been fine. Uh, the Old Testament, if the people had gone on, they had never violated the law, you know, then they would have had nothing to uh, to worry about. But they did violate the law over and over again, as you said. So they needed something better. They needed something new. Uh, and so this was something that God has brought forth to, uh, before them. Um, and it gives them a way to, once again, all of us want uh, to be his people. Um, and that's a very special relationship that we have uh, in Christ to have him as our God, uh, to, to have us as his people. Um, and it's something that I hope we cherish. I hope we cherish that relationship. Uh, Israel, when they stop cherishing that relationship, that's when they found themselves in trouble, uh, when they stop uh, focusing in on that. And so that's just a few things I guess we, we, we see um, out of this. And uh, what other additional comments would you add here? Well, I could be wrong, but, uh, but I'm amazed at how many times in, uh, in New Testament writing uh, that this basic concept is set forth, I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Every time I read it, it reminds me of the book of Hosea, mm -hmm. where, where uh, God says, you're going to be Loami, not, uh, you're going to be not my people. Not my people. And, but later, he says, you'll be my people. And previously, you know, when we were in sin, we were not God's people. But because of the great sacrifice of Christ, we become his people. Now, interestingly enough, as he continues, he notes that under the law of Moses, a child was born not knowing the law. Just like, again, if we go back to James, I'm not picking on him, but, no. but when James was born, he didn't know anything. That's right. Uh, there was a period of time when he, he, he couldn't say a word. Uh, he may have been trying to, but we didn't know what in the world he was saying you know, at the time. Uh, he grew because of uh, being around you and around Hannah mm -hmm. and being instructed by the people. Now he knows a lot of things, and he'll know more as time goes on. But they had to learn the law f after they were born. It had to be taught to them. Here, the quoting from Jeremiah, it says, now when we get to this new covenant, it won't be that way. Right. Instead, if you are a baby in Christ, if you're in the born into the family of God, you will already know. You'll have already been instructed. And so how interesting to look at, say, for example, um, Acts chapter 16, where, where Paul instructs uh, Lydia and God opens her heart. How? Through the instruction. Mm -hmm. That's how he does it. You got Jesus on the road to Emmaus and Jesus before the apostles in Luke chapter 24, both times. He opens up the scriptures so they can see it. Right. Uh, nobody who becomes a member of the church, who is added to the church because they're saved, not one of those people was saved without knowing something about Jesus Christ as the Son of God, mm -hmm. their own sinfulness, their need to confess the Son, and to put him on in baptism. Absolutely, and, and that's something that is just... It's very special uh, for us to understand this knowing and understand, you know, what it uh, you know, helps us to, I guess, gain entrance to and, and to have as par as part of our lives. You know, it, it, we continued uh, as, as you've read that um, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. That you know ability to be able to remember no more is. It's something that's beyond mankind. Oh, it is. Mankind's yeah. not good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for God, he, this is an intentional act on his, his part. Um, that as we come to him, as we have our sins washed away, as we repent, even as even as Christians that that occasionally do sin, you know, First John one nine, you know, he's faithful and just. He's going to forgive us. Right. Uh, and so we have the ability to have those sins washed away. Either talking about in baptism, you know, we're repenting of our sins, and we have that washing away that we talk about, or, or the washing away 
delay that we have, you know, even as we come and we repent as Christians, and he he will just he wipes the slate clean. Right. Uh, and that is an amazing thing that can only be done by God uh, to be merciful enough uh, and gracious enough to uh, to you know to wipe away those sins to, uh, to give us. Uh, to give us every day. Uh, it's a gift from God. Every day, we, it's an opportunity that we have to live for Him, to get our lives right again. Uh, and so um, here in Christ, uh, we have an opportunity to have those sins washed away. Uh, he, he is faithful to just take them away for, uh, from us. Um, he goes on and says, in that he says, a new covenant, he made the first obsolete and now is becoming, uh, and now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away the old law uh, christ uh nailed it to the cross it was it, it was there i mean it was something that uh that now we're living under the new testament uh times um and in these um and in these last days this is what the new testament is our is our governing you know writings our governing authority that, right. that is over us uh, the, the uh the law of christ and this is how we can find what we need to do in order to be saved what we need to do in order to be pleasing before him and what we need to do in order to be prepared for when he comes back, because you know our high priest, our king, uh, he is uh, coming back. He's coming back to take us home, uh, to deliver us up to the Father, uh, and what a great deliverance that will be. And we should long for that. Um, and so, just like the the, the, the writer in Jeremiah uh, writing to, to these people, trying to help and instruct, um, we need to pay attention to our lives and make sure that we are on the right path because judgment day is coming. Uh, for, the ch- for the children of Israel in the days of Jeremiah, their judgment, uh, their immediate judgment was going to be their captivity. Uh, you know, their, their long-lasting judgment would be much later, but as far as their immediate, that was something that was coming. For us, what we're, what we're waiting for is the, the very, you know, the end time. We don't know when it's coming, but we have to get ourselves prepared and ready uh, and thankfully, we have the new covenant to, to help us uh, do that.